Hi, so in this video what we're going to do is go through a whole series of processes showing you really how to make an experiment with this. Now this is the basic solar cell and it's made out of two bits of plastic and underneath those two bits of plastic is a bit of aluminium mesh to act as one electrode and a strip of copper painted on the other. Now this is the finalised version or one of the finalised versions that's been painted with my ink and then dropped on an electrolyte onto the top of the ink and that has quite good performance as you'll see later. Now, it's a series of experiments, and I wanted to show a series to give you an idea of the development that goes on in something. So the kind of stepwise processes that you go through. It's probably worth watching the video to the end, because um, this final version here actually has some quite good performance characteristics and gives you a good indication of where to go. Now, that actually produces about half a watt per square metre. And given that a commercial cell produces on average 30 watts a square metre, 150 watts under ideal conditions on average 30 watts, half a watt per square metre is actually getting quite cool. But particularly when you think in terms of the cost of the thing, a commercial um, setup is actually relatively expensive. This was astonishingly cheap and easy. Now, a cuprous oxide solar cell will produce you about 1.2 milliwatts per square metre. So not very much. This is going to do about 400 times better than that. So we're looking at something here that's getting quite close to being something you'd want to make at home by yourself so you could do your own solar cells. Um, I haven't finished with it. I'm going to progress it much further. But I did think that this series of experiments would be of interest to people. So I thought I'd do a video on it, even though it isn't actually finalised and it isn't a ta-da, there you go. Um, I still thought it would be interesting so you could see a stepwise process and look at the thing itself and maybe if you wanted to investigate it yourself then you had a jumping off point to look at your own investigations. Anyway, let's get on. Uh, advice of a friend of mine, I ordered some of this stuff which is uh, Japanese matcha, it's green tea. And it's very, very green if you have a look in there. Now apparently that's got quite a lot of plant extracts in it including the chlorophyll. So it's going to make an easy way for me to add uh, additional chlorophyll to my solar cell chlorophyll solution in order to do a bit of experimenting with chlorophyll concentrations. Obviously I have no idea how much chlorophyll is actually in here, but we can use this as our baseline. Now, given that I'm going to do so much experimentation on it, I thought I'd build a solar test cell. And this is it. So it's a piece of plastic. And on the plastic I've glued a copper plate, so it's just a bit of 6mm plastic, copper plate, 6 holes screws, and then 6 screws put in there. So the plan is to take a piece of this stuff, which is um, glass fibre tissue, fine grade, lay it over, drop the electrolyte on, and then using a bit of aluminium mesh over the top of that, put on the top plate, and we'll have a solar cell that we can test. So I'll test that, clean it, add a bit to the um, solution, test again, clean it, and so on, and we can see what happens. So, given that test setup, let's give it a go and see. Okay, so I've just bolted it down, and you can see that's giving 0.167 volts on that. So this is the original solution giving 0.167 volts. Let's put it onto the amp. So it's on the milliamp reading, and this is reading 1.18 milliamps. And the area of this is 7 by 9 centimetres. Okay, we're going to do a bit of math next. Let's have a look at the maths. We got uh, 0.167 volts, and we're putting out 1.18 um, milliamps, so that gives us 0.197 milliwatts. Nothing to write home about. Now the area was 70 by 90 millimeters, which is 6,300 millimeters squared. It's a million millimeters squared in the meter, so if we divide that by a million, we get 0 0.0063 meters squared. Now, to normalise that, clearly multiply by 1,000, divide by 6.3 will give us per metre squared, do the centre there, and what we get is 31.27 milliwatts per metre squared. Now, 31 milliwatts per metre squared is not a huge amount, but given a little context, if you use cuprous oxide, then you would get about 1.2 milliwatts per metre squared. Now, commercial cells, uh, and their best condition, produce about 150 watts per metre squared. And that's in bright sunlight. The average production actually is around about 30 watts per metre squared. So we're a long way off. We're a factor of um, about a thousand. So we're about a thousand out. But then we were under fluorescent light, remember, not in bright sunlight. So that's kind of a plus point. We'll have to do it in bright sunlight when we get sun to get a true comparison. And this is only our baseline so that we can look at the formulations. 
Anyway, it's clearly better than cuprous oxide, clearly nowhere near as good as a uh, commercial, but still very interesting. Okay, so I've cleaned this out, replaced it with a new separator, and in there I've got 20 millilitres of the original solution, but this time I've added half a gram of this stuff and sonicated it for half an hour to make sure it's really nicely mixed. So let's soak our separator in our new solution. Okay, so after adding that half a gram, we're now getting a reading of 2.3 milliamps, which is more or less doubled the output. And we're getting 0.194 volts, nearly 0.2 volts. So here I am shining a light on it. And it looks about 3.6. 3.5, 3.6. Okay, it's um, pretty cold actually here today. It's about five degrees centigrade or maybe six. So I've uh, heated up a beaker of water and I'm just gonna put it on a beaker of water and we'll see if warming it up has any effect. I mean, you would expect it would. So let's have a look. Temperature is 39.2 and we're getting 10 milliwatts, which means per square meter, it's about 325. Uh, milliwatts, so a third of a watt per square metre. Again, not fantastic, but this is the first deep eutectic solvent we've tried, and we've only tried one mix. I would say this looks pretty promising, actually, because obviously you would want to try, or I want to try, different eutectic solvents with different concentrations and different amounts of ions in this particular structure, but we're certainly getting some, uh, I think, pretty impressive results. Let's drop down to 9.8. And yeah, that temperature's dropped to 37, actually. So it's pretty temperature dependent. I wonder what it's doing on the volts. And the voltage is actually reasonably stable. 0.182. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay, so continuing these experiments, and I have to tell you it's quite late, it's actually about midnight and pretty cold, hence the jacket. My wife thinks she's a bit of a chemistry widow actually, so I'm down the lab running this experiment again. And this time, I've put a layer of my ink onto the copper, and then the separator, and then the mesh. And as you can see, it's reading about 6.8, 6.9 milliamps, which is pretty good. Okay, I really can't leave well alone. And you can see that we're getting 13.7, 13.8 milliamps out of this. And what I've done is I've um, coated the copper this time with my uh, waterproof ink, which is actually nanoporous. So I've coated it with the waterproof ink and I've dropped some of the um, solution, the electrolyte solution onto it, and we're getting about 13.7 milliamps. That's kind of very cool. Of course, we're, um, we're in the lab, it's night outside, we're working under fluorescent lights, and it's pretty cold, so we've got about 10 degrees centigrade. Let's see if we can get a light response out of it. Hmm. Fourteen point six. And as you'd expect, it's now dropping back down, fourteen point two. Let's have a look at the voltage. So we're getting about 0.199 volts. Okay, so it's been a bit of a trawl through actually, because you know there's been lots of experiments done in this uh, video. And not all of them really conclusive, but certainly very interesting. So, a quick look at the map to put it all together a little bit. We're getting um, nearly 2.2 volts at 14.6 milliamps, giving us round about 0.29 watts, uh, milliwatts, sorry, 0.29 milliwatts for the area that we were looking. So, if we normalize that to a square meter, what we get is round about 463 milliwatts, so about half a watt, just less than half a watt per meter squared. Now, that's actually getting there. That's getting quite impressive, in fact, for such a structure. When you think that a commercial solar cell produces, on average, about 30 watts, 150 watts in bright sunlight, on average 30 watts. We're working at about 6 degrees centigrade, hence the code, in uh, pitch black, just these three fluorescent lights on. So the amount of incident light hitting that thing is quite tiny. 
So obviously, there's a lot to do still from here. I just thought I'd go through the experiments with you so you can see what happens, really. So obviously, what we need to do is worry about things like stability. I mean, you know, we're doing this over a short period of time. There's only been about uh, three, four days of experimentation. So we don't know how long that um, solution is going to last. We don't know if it's going to last a week, a year, a day. We just don't know. So we have to give it some kind of stability testing to see how long it's actually going to last. We haven't actually done it in the sunlight yet because we haven't had a chance to do it in the sunlight. So obviously we need to do it in the sunlight and see what we get on a warm sunny day. We know it responds to heat. The higher the temperature, the higher the output. So if we stick it on a roof um, in the middle of summer, who knows what we'll get at this stage, but certainly worth experimenting with. Now I've only used one type of deputectic solvent on there and that was the chilling chloride and um, ethylene glycol. There are a whole host of solvents that we could use to try and see if we can get an improvement. Also, I've only used one type of conductive ink, and as you know, there's about four types of conductive ink that I make that each have its own properties. The particular one we used actually is waterproof. It's waterproof but microporous, so it's acting like a um, membrane. But maybe it will respond better if we make the ink uh, as part of the uh, component part of the solution. We mix the whole thing together and we chuck it in there. At this stage, we don't know. What we know is we're getting some exciting results that are certainly worth following through. Um, anyway, I found the whole process really, really interesting. And you can see that we're progressing from tiny amounts to actually producing something that's getting quite reasonable. Half a watt per square meter is actually quite reasonable, particularly when you think about the cost of the thing. Because of course, me making this on a strip of um, copper with painted with ink and dropped on with that solution is a hell of a lot cheaper than the process methods needed to make a commercial solar cell. So in terms of uh, cost per kilowatt, we're probably not far off from a commercial solar cell. Uh, certainly we need a bigger area to produce the same amount, but the cost would be um, pretty comparable. So it's all getting very, very exciting with this, and I feel that you know, just a few more experiments, we're actually going to get something where we can say, hey, look, here's a home-produced solar cell that's really cheap to make, really easy to make, and as good as one that you can buy from a commercial supplier. So um, I think it's really cool, and I hope it hasn't been too boring for you, and I hope you enjoyed watching, and thank you very much for watching.